Hello, I'm Dr. Ola Kammerdiner. Welcome to Discrete Event Simulation. This is Lecture 18, Statistical Analysis of Output from Terminating Simulations. I will talk about time frame of simulations, strategy for data collection and analysis, and also confidence intervals. So the question that we want to ask is, why use statistics to analyze output? Well, as you know, we're using random input in the simulation. And so this random input also causes our output to be random as well. And this is known as uh, RIRO or RIRO. And so we run a simulation only once and we get some output of it. We don't quite know because this is only a single realization of what might happen. We don't quite know what it means. First of all, we don't know was that run that we just had uh, ran typical or was it and some kind of outlier, not typical run. And also we know that there are going to be some variability from run to run of the same model. So again, we need statistical analysis of output data. And there are three different reasons why we need this statistical analysis of output. First of all, to better understand a single model configuration also to be able to compare two or more different configurations and to be able to search for an optimal configuration. In uh, practice, statistical analysis of output is often ignored, but that is not correct. This is actually a big mistake because we won't know um, much about precision of results. We get some estimates, but we don't know how precise these estimates are. So not hard or time consuming to be able to do statistical analysis of, of output. It just takes some planning and uh, preparation and some thought and also some computer time. So it's very important to distinguish different two different time frames of simulations the terminating and the steady state. And terminating simulation is when we have specific starting and specific stopping conditions. In this case, the run lens will be well defined and also finite. So the other time frame is steady state. And steady state means that it's a long run and that we technically want it to be forever. Of course, we don't quite uh, get to run something forever. And so even though theoretically initial conditions don't matter in practice because we're not going to run it forever, they actually do matter. And again, it's not clear when and how to terminate the run. So since we have two time frames of simulation, the question is whether to do terminating or steady state. And so this is really a question of the intent of our study. And the answer that we choose whether to determine or steady state will have a major impact on how output analysis is done. And of course, sometimes it's not completely clear which one is more appropriate. And so right now we're going to discuss the terminating and then we'll talk about steady state later. So in terms of the strategy for data collection and analysis in the terminating simulation case, we will uh, need to make in um, IID replications. So we're doing um, independent and identically distributed replications. And so we're going to select run setup replication parameters. And in replication parameters, 
in the number of replications field, uh, we also need to change um, both boxes for initialize between replications. And so um, let's go ahead and do that. So here I open model 5.3 uh, from the book and I'm going to go ahead and save it as model 6.1 since we started discussing chapter 6 from the book. So now that I did that, I'm going to go to run and then set up and then I will choose in replication parameters, I will have here initialized between replications. So you can see here statistics and system is selected. If they weren't selected, we wouldn't be producing the independent, identically distributed replications. And because there would be some dependencies, right? Uh, if we don't initialize between replications, our system and statistics, then the uh, results of several multiple replications would actually be dependent. So let me go ahead and change the number of replications to 10 and uh, save this. So now that I did that, the next thing I want to double check is that um, I don't want to waste too long of time waiting for replications, all replications to finish. So I want to make sure that here under run run control, I select batch run. Um, the batch run will be the fastest possible. So again, no animation is engaged. So you can see that the batch run is checked. If it wasn't checked, I would just click on it and uh, so again, run, run control, and then click. And then when I look at the run control, I see the batch run is selected. So then it's going to be really fast. I'm going to go ahead and select go. It will um, run all the replications very fast, as you can see. And I'm going to be able to see the results. So I'm going to click yes to see the results. And then it will open category overview report for me, for for my model. So here, right, what I see is just is just overall information. And you can see there are ten replications that we ran. And so, again, as I scroll through the pages, um, it also uh, generated the half width and the average rate that allows me to gather or construct the um, intervals. And this is because, again, I have multiple replications. So as you, as you see, right, I have a lot of different, but this is all together already for the replications. Uh, if I wanted to know by replication, I would uh, right. So this is a category of reviews that I now am looking at. If I wanted to know information for each replication, I can look at category by replication. And in category by replication, I can see different values that I received for each different replication. So again, right, I can scroll as this is my first replication and I can look at different information for replication one. Um, again, right, this is for a single replication. It's not a sufficient half width. So this is just the average information for the first time, first replication. And it produced 10 different replications, right? So I can also look at uh, the same information for uh, replication 2, and so on for all the replications. So that is where we got this table, right? It's just basically by looking at each uh, replication in ARENA uh, category by replication report. And specifically there, we would need to click on user specified 
and then look at the output and that gives us the percent rejected and total cost right this is for replication one you see i'm looking at user specified output for replication two i can also select replication then user specified then output and this is right on the different pages you can see different uh, uh results of the for the output and then for replication three again click on user specified click on output and this is again new page new results right this is for replication three and we can do that for all 10 replications right so you can see four five six seven eight nine and here we back to replication 10. So notice, right, in these results, we have the different replications listed here in the first column. In the second column, we have our output of total cost um, for each replication, right? So you can see this is what we got. And then percentage percent rejected, right, we also have in the third column. So when you look through different replications, you notice this cross replication variability right we didn't get the same numbers for all replications the replication uh, different replication gives us different numbers so um, what we need to do is we need to understand you know what to make out of this so also notice that when we looked at category overview report it also had some statistical analysis results of output across replications. So the question is, how many replications? And also, uh, this you know might be a difficult question, and that will require some trial and error for now. But there is also some formulas that allows us to approximate the number for with some acceptable precision. And we'll discuss two of these uh, methods um, later. There is also sequential sampling. And sequential sampling is quite an interesting uh, method that was developed um, in terms of being able to uh, obtain the results earlier or some, sometimes being able to uh, obtain the results um uh, ahead of uh, or using a smaller sample so it's actually a quite an interesting technique and I uh, suggest that you read more about it in, in chapter 12 but it's especially useful for quality control so it's uh, it really is uh, something that you you should learn more about and then we can also turn off um, animation altogether for maximum speed and you saw me do that through the uh, batch run and so as i said we go to run run control batch run so that's gonna give us the fastest speed and so let's discuss confidence intervals for terminating systems Using formulas that we talked about in chapter 2, we can actually view cross-replication summary outputs as, as the basic data. And so you can see that we have the sample mean, and there is a sample standard deviation, and we can also get the 95% confidence interval halfway. And we can also notice that these going to be our min minimum and maximum summary output values. And this is for total cost. And the same stuff we can also get for percent rejected. So the question is, what would this be the most useful in this information? Of course, without a doubt, uh, the most useful part is 95% confidence interval on the expected values. And this information, except the standard deviation, is also can be found in category overview report, right? So not only it can be computed from the cross replication summary, but also found in the category overview report through the using the half width. 
so so you can see here right this was our cross replication information and category by replication and then when we look at category overview if we open this up we can actually get the output information here and so we get this half width for the total cost and also for the percent rejected along with the average so we can take the average and the half width to construct the confidence intervals and what we should know is that if we have more than one replication arena just uses cross replication data as above and um, again as our confidence levels we could use uh, output analyzer to get um, the graphical representation as well and so if you talk about the half width right the half width is connected with the number of replication and we would like of course to have smaller confidence intervals that will give us a higher precision so recall right that if we have n representing the number of replication x bar is our sample mean the s is a sample standard deviation and then the t with parameters n minus one and one minus alpha over two is a critical value from the t table then the confidence interval can be found using this formula so we simply use this sample mean and then we add and subtract from it this uh, value right this this is a product of the critical value from t table multiplied by simple standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of replications and so half width is just this part right this part here right that we subtract and add so you can see right again this is a uh, critical value from t table multiply by the simple standard deviation and divided by square root of the number of replications so to get the higher precision we want this half width to be as small as possible right so to be um if you want it to be small right for example less or equal than some value h where h is per specified um, we need to we need to increase the number of replications right because the larger the number of replications the larger the square root of number of replications and because we divided it the smaller is going to be the half width but unfortunately we cannot control t or s right because as the number of replication grows so does the uh, sample standard deviation is going to increase so the question is right we do need to increase and but by how much so what we could do is we can set half width to um, some value h that is as i said already uh, specified in advance and then we can solve for n and if we do that we'll get n equals right to the critical value of uh, for t and then square this value and also square the uh, standard sample deviation and square uh, divide by square h so again right if you look at this it's really not solved for t in in the strong sense because the t value right the critical value depends on n but also the simple deviation is if you remember the formula of simple deviation right it also depends on n so both of these t and s depend on n and so to do uh, right to be able to uh, evaluate and right that we need for specific half width all we can do is 
do some approximations. And so we can, for example, replace t by z. So, of course, right, z, as you remember, is a standard normal deviation, right? So we actually looking at the z being normal uh, distribution's critical value. And z does not depend on n, uh, so that will, you know, take care of this dependence of t on n, but the normal distribution is not quite the same as t distribution, right? So they're, they're different. So because of that, again, right, that's an approximation. We also can pretend that current S will hold for larger samples. Of course, that's not quite true, um, but that's, again, is just approximation. So we can use the current S, right, but the S is also going to depend on N. So if we do that, then we're going to get this kind of approximation, right? So this is a Z at 1 minus alpha over 2, right? Because the critical value of normal, standard normal distribution also depends on uh, alpha. And then divide it, uh, multiply by S squared, which is the current standard deviation, right? It's standard deviation from our initial number and zero of replications, right? Let's say here we did 10 replications, so our initial number of replication would be n zero equals 10, and then we can use that in the formula, right, to find the, the larger n for specified h. And again, there's another which is easier uh, approximation, but it's it's also uh, an approximation, right, and it's a different approximation that we could have where n is approximated as n0, which is our initial number of replication, multiplied by uh, h squared 0 divided by h uh, squared. So h0 here is a half width from the initial number of replications. So if we do it uh, like that, right, or like this, we're not going to get the same values of n. But in both cases, you can see that n grows quadratically as h decreases, right? So if we need to um, decrease h just linearly, right, it's actually going to grow quadratically and n grows quadratically large. So that says that we need much more replications, right, to just even get a smaller decrease. So if you look at the application, right, to our model, model 6.1, from initial 10 replications, we also have 95% half width on total cost, right, and that was the 812.82 hundreds, right, and so this is going to, be 33.8 percent right of of x right of of the x which is our average um so now right let's get this down to right from the 812 approximately to 215 and less right so we want to reduce this right because this is quite large it's 3.8 percent um in comparison to to our um cost so if we use the first formula and we just plug in the values for the first formula, so this is a critical value, um, right, for for us, this is the simple standard deviation, right, and this is our desired half width, we're going to get this number of replications, right, so 80. So that's, again, right, using this formula here. Then we can also use the second formula. If you use the second formula, this is going to be, right, the initial number of replication and zero. Then here we have our initial half width squared and then divided by desired half width squared. Right, so again, this is according to this formula. So now we're going to get 105.7, right, so we can have a fractional number of replications 
So we need to increase it right to get to 106. So as you can see, right, those two formulas give us quite different estimates in terms of how many replications we need to do to get this value down to 250 or less. So again, right, we can, we can go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and modify model 6.1 into model 6.2. And then again, we keep um, the batch run for speed. And then in run set up replication parameters, we're going to change the number of replications to 110. Right, so as you can see, this is very conservative. So it's even more than 106. But let's try and do that. So here I'm going to stop my simulation run and I'm going to go to right, close this for now. And I'm back to my model 6.1. So I'm going to save this model 6.1 um, in case, you know, I made some changes and didn't save it. And now I'm going to save it as a new model, model 6.2, because I'm going to change the number of replications here for this model and so let me go ahead and go to the run and then set up and then the replication parameters instead of 10 replications I'm going to select 110 replications and then say OK and again just to demonstrate I already selected the batch run so run uh, run control you can see batch run already selected here so now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run my uh, model 6.2 and observe the results. So as you can see, it's uh, running 110 replications, so it's even longer. So if you didn't select the batch run, you can uh, imagine how much longer that would be with animation. So now that it ran the completion, let's take a look at uh, our report. So in my report, I'm interested in my user specified statistics, specifically in the output that tells me, right, so I'm going to move in the report, right, because the output here says that the uh, last page going to be at the last page. I'm going to click on the last page and look at the output so my output is percent rejected right i can see here right this is uh, actually sorry i want to do this to with the total cost so i'm looking at the total cost right this is my average and this is my half width so you saw that we got uh, 110 we selected 110 as the number of replications and based on our estimates we and that was conservative right because it was more than 80 that we had was formula one and more than 106 which we got was the formula two and that those formulas right we used to achieve a desired precision was a half width of 250 right well here you can see that this is not really 250 so now um that we did that, we obtained uh, the interval, the confidence interval of 22,175 um, and then 0 0.19 plus minus 369.54, right? Which is, which is close to 250, closer than it is to 812 that we had before but it's still a bit of undershot right we didn't we didn't get to 250. so again right from the um 110 replications we also got uh right uh the smaller half woods four percent rejected so we got this confidence interval of 11 point uh seven hundred forty five thousandth uh plus minus uh um, 0 0.51 on percent rejected in terms of the confidence interval 
so of course, as you can see, right, this is also an improved uh, confidence interval where the half width is reduced and the precision is higher. So we use the maximum of sample sizes for precisions on multiple out, uh, outputs, and so it's very important to keep in mind, right, to, to use this rule, right, use the maximum of sample sizes for precisions on multiple outputs. So if we have the percent rejected uh, in the total um, costs, we, and we compute the a replication number for total costs and another replication number for project rejected, we would then select the maximum of the number of replications. And so let's talk about interpretation of uh, confidence intervals. The interval was um, random or data dependent endpoints is the confidence interval, right? So those endpoints as you saw right there, computed as uh, as uh, the values that include sample standard deviation. And so sample standard deviation is random, right? It's an estimate and it's a random. And so the endpoints is also are also going to be random. And so this confidence interval is an interval with a random data dependent endpoints that's supposed to have stated probability of containing or covering expected value. And so we, we, we have the target, right? The target is expected value, right? It's fixed but a known number. So we know that the confident interval, right, has um, our stated probability, right? So say if it's 95%, confidence intervals and our probability is 0 0.95 that uh, this interval that we built it actually contains the expected value but we really don't know what is the expected value right we have an estimate of it but we don't know what it is the confidence interval so tells us it was 95 percent probability these unknown expected value is inside our confidence interval. And when you look at the expected value, it's an average of an infinite number of replications. So not an interval that contains 95% of the data, right? Sometimes people think of it this way, but this is definitely not correct. So you should really understand that confidence interval is the interval that was 95% probability or 0 0.95 probability contains the average value, right, that we don't know. So again, right, if, if we thought about 95% of the data uh, containing the interval, that would be a prediction interval. It would be, it's again a useful interval, but it's definitely not the confidence interval. It's different. So usual formulas assume normally distributed data, right? In reality, that's not true. And that's one of the reasons also that we saw our approximation formulas, right, being quite far as well, right? Not really that far. So it might be approximately true if output is an average, but uh, rather than an extreme. But you need to be careful, right, because we, we can't say for sure. And in that case, again, right, we uh, base our assumptions on, on this uh, using the standard limit theorem. And in terms of the robustness, coverage, and precision, right, you actually can see much more details um, in the textbook, or in the textbook and specifically model um, 6.3. So um, you get to practice that, what you learned right in, in the courses and also in uh, the labs.